our taskmaster, Carmen, punished me by asking me to open this morning and then close uh, this afternoon. Uh, I do have uh, some sad news to report. Um, I was just told that Cristina Diego Gonzalez will not be able to join us due to a death in the family. Uh, so our prayers go out to her. But I would like to end on a positive note. I would like to end thinking about the future. And Carlos, earlier today, as a historian, urged you to record your history. As a social scientist, I'm going to give you an additional task. Think about the future. And the reason I say that is because I believe that our generation has a peculiar set of skills. We are a generation that still has memories of Republican Cuba, pre-Castro Cuba, <laughs> juvenile me memories perhaps, but we do have that memory. And we have also had an opportunity to live for an extended period of time in freedom, to live and to learn. And hopefully we can combine that skill set to help somehow in the reconstruction of our homeland when that time comes. We all have different experiences. And we all have tremendous things to contribute. When uh, Juan Clark was parachuting into the Bay of Peaks, I was in the underground hiding and running for my skin. Eloy ended up with a butler. I ended up picking tomatoes in Homestead. So we do have a tremendous amount of skill. We're also, I think, at a point in our lives where, I'll speak for myself, but I think uh, I can generalize a little bit, we're no longer starting a career, perhaps we're not raising young children. We're at a point when we can give back. I was happily retired about five years ago when Dr. Jaime Sushliki, and you all may know as a historian, uh, who had 25 years earlier directed my doctoral dissertation, called me and said, Joe, I know you're retired, but I need you here. Uh, I need someone to come and, and help me. You have the scholarly side, you have a successful business career, and, and I need you to come and help me. In classical Jaime fashion, I can't pay you anything, but you, uh, you have to come and help me. And I've been doing that for the last four years. So I, I think we're at that point uh, where we can begin to give back. During this period of time, uh, I began to think about the transition and what kind of a transition what can we can look forward to and how can we help. Uh, I wrote uh, my book, Mañana in Cuba, which I hope you all read. I have no financial interest. I'm donating all the proceeds to the University of Miami. But I hope you, you have an opportunity to read it. The first few chapters, I warn you, are rather depressing because I try to describe Cuba's civil society today. A civil society unlike us that has not had an opportunity to live and learn in freedom. A civil society that unfortunately has learned to lie as a means of survival, has learned to cheat and steal as a means of survival. It's okay to steal from the state, you steal the light bulb so you can sell it on the black market and feed your family. So when that time for change comes, we are going to find a civil society, perhaps not ideal upon which to build a democratic state and a market economy if that should be the transition path. So I looked at all the Eastern European transition, there's been now 34 or so countries that have transitioned since the collapse of the Soviet Union and there's a tremendous amount of information that we can learn from the experience of the transition in countries. In doing my, my research, I came across a sub-discipline, if you might call it that, of economics called behavioral economics. And this particular discipline sort of looks at how to nudge people into making better decisions. The word nudge doesn't quite translate into Spanish. Inducir is probably the closest that we can come up with. So I started thinking, 
how, how can this discipline be used in a post-Castro Cuba environment, given that we're going to find, again, a civil society, which is not the best. So I'd like to give you a couple of examples of, of, of that and give you ideas and then open it up for some questions. I'm rather a polemicist and I sort of want to provoke a, a little bit of, of thought along this line. Two examples of this uh, quasi-science of, of uh, behavioral economics. I'll give you a serious one and then I'll give you, a, I, I think, a rather uh, funny one. The serious one, uh, it turns out in the United States, as we, as we all know, uh, there's a tremendous shortage of organ donations. Uh, people actually die waiting for organs to be known. And yet many of us, in informal conversations, may express to each other, you know, if something should happen to me in an automobile accident or, or something like that, I would like to be a donor. But we never take the steps to inscribe ourselves as donors. The default law in the United States is you are considered not to be a donor unless you have taken the steps to register. In many European countries, they have changed the default. You are considered automatically to be a donor unless you opt out of the system. Obviously, there's been a tremendous increase in uh, organ donations and the resulting savings of life. That is just an example of how a policy can be structured to induce a certain behavior without, again, taking any liberties away, because obviously you have the option. The other one um, that I'll give you as an example and then sort of give you some ideas as to how this can be used, there was an airport in uh, Sweden, I believe it was, where they were men's uh, bathroom, they were having a sanitation problem. I suppose the uh, uh, bathroom was close to a bar or something, but apparently when the gentlemen were going into the bathroom, they were not aiming properly and there was <laughs> urine all over the place. <coughs> well, the totalitarian solution would have been to place a miliciano there or someone to make sure that we aim properly. <laughs> The nudging solution was to paint a black fly in each of the urinals. It turns out when we see the fly, we aim at the fly. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> they actually measured this and there was an 85% improvement in the image. In the <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. So I, I urge you to sort of look at that, at that literature. So we, sort of armed with that, I started to think, you know, how could this be used in, in Cuba. And, and here again, I'll give you two examples, uh, one on the economic side and one on the political side, and then I'll have you shoot at me. Um, on the economic side, I would think that perhaps a policy of dollarization, and, and again, I'm assuming that at some point we're going to have not just a succession, but we're going to have a legitimate transition. And academics like to make the distinction between a succession which is what we have from one general to another, and eventually a transition, hopefully, to democracy and free markets. To dollarize the Cuban economy. Now, my friends that are economists always complain, oh, well, you know, that's, that's perhaps not the best way to do it, because if you have a talented, skill, or skillful central bank and a prudent government, it's better to have the flexibility of a, a flexible currency. Well, you know what? Chances are you're not going to have a highly talented, independent, prudent central bank. Neither are you going to have perhaps a prudent government at that time. So in my way of thinking, a dollarization, and by the way, I don't care if it's the dollar or the echo or the South uh, African rand. It doesn't matter. What I'm trying to do with that idea is to sort of tie the hands of that future government that chances are is not going to be very experienced so that they will not just print money and solve all the problems. One of the reasons that I say that is because my working theory is that 
after 52 years of totalitarian rule, the Cuban population has internalized socialist values. And what I mean by that is a number, a couple of things. Number one, uh, if you were to construct a model as to the relationships between a people and its government, in our democratic model, uh, government, the model is change originates from the bottom up. Change originates from, with the people and then is transmitted to the government through our electoral processes. That model, however, in a totalitarian system is from the top down. Change always originates at the top. So the Cuban people have become accustomed to spec change from the top down. And this concept that is so innate to us, that change originates from the bottom up, it's, it's really not quite something that people relate to. So given that, perhaps on the economic realm, uh, that would be a good idea. On the political realm, I advance that perhaps this post-Cuban government should consider a parliamentary system as opposed to a presidential system. In Latin America, for the most part, in Hispanic Latin America, we have always copied the United States with a presidential system. And we count on a certain division of powers, an independent judiciary, an independent uh, executive, and an independent uh, parliamentary uh, Congress. Well, the idea of an independent judiciary is still a goal in most of Latin America today. I don't think there are many countries in Latin America, and perhaps not many countries in the developing world, where you can truly say the judiciary is independent. And without an independent judiciary, the whole system begins to think. So what about a parliamentary system? We've never done it in Latin America as such. Yeah, La Constitución del 40 sort of had a prime minister, but it, it wasn't really a parliamentary system. Well, there are three varieties of parliamentary system we can consider, <laughs> semi-parliamentary, semi-presidential, hybrid. I'm sure we'll come up with one a la cubana. But what I love about a parliamentary system, a number of things. Number one, I like that division of power. I like the fact that you have a head of government, which I envision as being this very boring accounting type that is just going to be uh, keeping the budgets right and all that. And then the head of state, which can be the guy that likes to give the grandiose speeches and likes to talk all day long and all that kind of stuff. So that's one, I, one reference point, that division of powers between a head of state and a head of government. Another reason that I think a parliamentary system might be worth looking at is that the Cuban people have not had the opportunity to see debates, to see their representatives debating. Under a presidential system, you may have a campaign and you have some speeches. And the uh, campaign is over, you elect someone, and that's about it. When you look at the parliamentary debates in the United Kingdom, I love it. They fight with each other, they scream at each other. In South, um, South Korea, they throw chairs at each other, they fight. I, I think that's terrific. From a pedagogical point of view, the Cuban people would really learn to see that kind of stuff. Uh, so pedagogically, I think that would be a wonderful thing that la novelita de la tarde, tu sabes, el parlamento, you know. Uh, and you would be surprised how the media can, can help in, in, in that respect. Uh, another reason, perhaps, is we're very impatient. We have a presidential system, maybe with a four-year term or a five-year term. We elect someone. Two years into that term, we don't like it. We want to change it, so we have a coup d'etat. And then we violate the whole rule of law. Under a parliamentary system, if we don't like it, that's fine. You can change it every week if you want to. And imagine the kind of system that it's going to be. The other reason is because it will force us to do something that we're not very good at doing. We're going to have to negotiate with each other and form a government by making compromises. You know, in, in the North American tradition, 
the candidates go into a campaign, they insult each other, the campaign is over, they kiss and make up, no problem. In our tradition, four generations later, a mi abuelito, tú le dijiste en el año mil You know, we still keep those kinds of, of, uh, of uh, rencores over many, many years. Uh, political parties, there will be many. When Lech Walesa was asked uh, at the beginning of the Polish Revolution why there were, I think, 120 political parties, he says, well, you get two polls together, you have three parties, yours, mine, and ours. I think that's going to be about the same proportion for Cubans. Two Cubans together, you're going to have three, maybe even four political parties. We'll figure out a way of doing that as well. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this is that we have a unique opportunity in our generation and our community because we have had the opportunity to leave our lives and to learn outside to think about how can we help. I think most of us also have no professional ambitions, no political ambitions of any, of any kind. I think most of us are at a point in our lives where we want to give back. Um, we're not looking to uh, begin our lives again or any such thing. So from that standpoint of thinking about the future, what can we do? How can we contribute? And those are some of the ideas that, that I would like to share with you and, and hopefully you'll have an opportunity to think about it and send me an email and say, you know, I thought about this way of nudging. I thought about this way because that parliamentary system, again, in my way of thinking, is a way of nudging. It's a way of inducing better behavior, not only in the part of the citizens, but also in the part of those that are governing. With that in mind, just to change pace a little bit, what I like to do is, is open it up for, for questions and maybe some things that we can address. Uh, if you have any things that you would like to, to throw out on, on that basis.